Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, thank you for uh, Andrew, Bruce, Rob, and others for helping arrange this. Uh, uh, it's really a thrill to be back on this campus. Uh, it is a wonderful place. You have such a vibrant and amazing group of scholars kind of working across disciplines, especially uh, around CITS. Um, so it's just, again, a thrill to be here. Um, the title of the talk today, uh, a little bit long, but I think it uh, uh, reflects the, the kind of meandering course that the talk itself is going to take. So communication, consumption, and civil society, you usually don't think about consumption and civil society hand in hand, but I want to persuade you that maybe we start, should start thinking about them that way. Um, this work began with a very simple assumption, and it turned out to be very wrong uh, in some respects, and that is we are what we buy. Um, and I began it with an even more basic assumption, and that is that it wasn't a good thing, that consumption was kind of inherently bad. And I have to say I came out of, uh, I worked in marketing communications. I uh, uh, graduated from the University of Wisconsin as an undergraduate and went off and worked in advertising. And my first gig was working on the McDonald's kids account. Uh, so I was selling hamburgers to two to five-year-old children. <laughs> and if there's, you know, I was told on my second day on the job that my, my function was that Ronald McDonald was the second most recognized fictional character after Santa Claus, and my job was to make him number one. Um, that was, I began my, my course towards graduate studies the third day I was there. Um, so, you know, I, the sense that I, I've been worried about the role consumption plays uh, in our lives and the role that media plays in conveying a kind of consumer culture has been with me for quite some time. Um, and it was kind of... Uh, this, this set of concerns that, that drew me to this topic. Um, now, I'll, I'll warn you at the beginning that this is a winding and twisted tale, and that's not, not to scare you. Um, most lines of research are not straight. They're usually filled with corrections and revisions and uh, self-assessments where we have to kind of take stock of the fact that we were very wrong in our assumptions and we have to make uh, 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 it redirect. Um, so this one is characterized by those kinds of corrections and extensions and reorientations. Um, and the assumptions that kind of began this work uh, have really been inverted by the time uh, uh, I kind of arrived at my current point. So um, where I started was with the concern about media and collective action. I know a lot of us here in this room are concerned with the question of the relationship between media and participatory culture. Um, a lot of us uh, uh, began by looking at work by people like Robert Putnam, who was you know, very concerned about the role especially television played in diminishing civic culture, uh, making the argument that it was either the mean world of television and us seeing these kinds of depictions of uh, a crime and, and, and the scariness of that world that led us to withdraw from social life because of distorted perceptions of social reality. Um, or it was the time displacement argument, and that was this notion that the more time we spent consuming television, the less time we had to be in the public square and with our friends and family. Um, what's interesting about either of those arguments is that, that, that they haven't received much support. When you start, start breaking down television into how people watch it, you realize that so much of television viewing is social or parasocial or interacting with other people. Uh, more than that, it uh, depends on what you watch. It's not just whether you watch how many hours, but if you're consuming news or social dramas, then it can actually have some very pro-civic consequences while other kinds of content less so. Um, but there was a third argument that emerged kind of as a response to the failure of those first two, and that was advanced by Juliet Shore out of, um, uh, she was at Harvard and then at Boston College, and she implicated television and individualism. Her argument was that it was the commercial culture of television, its focus on our needs over everybody else's, that was actually the root cause of why exposure to so much television was leading people to become less civically and politically engaged. Um, and so that kind of commercial appeals and its connection to consumer culture provided this kind of third account of the media social capital link. And with the background I brought, this just appealed to me. It just made sense. Of course, this should be the connection. Um, and what we know about media and consumption makes me maybe feel a little more confident. Um, you know, participation has been linked to news use, certainly. Um, but most of the relationships between entertainment TV viewing and, and uh, participation have been negative. So maybe entertainment TV is bad for civic life. Um, media also is known to shape consumption. Status consciousness tends to be related to exposure to lots of commercial appeals, and we see lots of those certainly in television uh, uh, and other media content. And socially conscious consumption and social consciousness in general uh, has been thought to be more related to, to news content. Now, again, 
that's probably way too simplistic a distinction. And in retrospect, I, I even realize that more. We know that politics pervades a lot of entertainment TV. There's uh, a great deal of uh, uh, entertainment content that you know, rips stories from the headlines or, or, or talks about social and political issues in complex ways. People like Bill Gamson have talked about the life world of television, maybe even addressing issues like abortion with more complexity than the news does. Um, at the same time, we know that news contains lots and lots of commercial appeals and brand appeals. Um, and so this is not so clear a, a, a situation. Nonetheless, we embarked on an initial study, and this was based on secondary analysis of the DDB Needham Lifestyle Study, which is a large commercial data set that was available to us uh, uh, through connections we had in the Chicago advertising community. And this is a paper that appeared in um, Public Communication quite some time ago, 2004, where what we did is we, it was a structural equation model, we controlled for a whole host of variables, and looked at uh, the relationship between a series of latent variables with civic participation. And I'll just kind of highlight some of the relationships to take you through this relatively quickly. If we look just first at the relationship between news viewing uh, on the back end here and the path to civic participation, well, positive uh, relationship. Uh, uh, entertainment viewing to civic participation, negative relationship. So kind of confirming that initial assumption but the relationship gets a little more complicated than that. So entertainment TV also has this positive relationship to status orientation, which drives status consumption. Okay, wonderful. But news consumption also has these effects on status orientation and status consumption. Um, and again, this may be partly because there is so much brand content in the news. Actually, there's been content analyses that shows that between uh, a third and one half of news content is oftentimes references to products that are available, new movie launches, uh, 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 new services. But even more interesting is this relationship uh, 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 of news to both socially conscious consumption and then through environmental orientation towards more socially conscious consumption. So we see these kinds of dual pathways, and we expected that while socially conscious consumption would be positive related to civic participation and status conscious consumption negatively, instead we see this cycle of three significant positive interrelationships, not terribly strong, but the people who are being more civic are also being more consumptive, both in terms of status orientation and in terms of socially conscious consumption. And this was puzzling. This was puzzling to us partly because, again, I went in with that strong assumption that consumption was bad. How could status conscious consumption be something that's positive to civic life? Well, the answer didn't come from a conventional social scientific approach. Instead, it came from critical theory, and specifically the work of Pierre Bourdieu. Um, and this is one of the great benefits of the department I'm in, uh, uh, where we have a w wide array of different perspectives, and I've, I've learned so much from my colleagues. Uh, uh, the person who really introduced me to Pierre Bourdieu is Lou Friedland. Uh, Bruce knows Lou well as, uh, uh, also. Um, Bourdieu's argument, very simply, is that cultural goods, consumption in particular, circulate as forms of power, and they're markers of class distinction. Uh, and so we gain access to certain social circles through our consumption of fashion, art, media. That's how we show we belong. How many people have ever seen the movie The Talented Mr. Ripley? All right? I mean, this notion that we can kind of, through our displays, our outward displays, show that we belong to a certain social set is a great example of that. Or Six Degrees of Se Separation with Will Smith is another great example of that same notion that by presenting ourselves certain ways by displaying certain taste, by uh, uh, consuming certain products, we belong to a certain social set. So this connects cultural and social capital in some interesting ways. Um, now, what's interesting is Bourdieu's insights grew from 1960s France, the question of whether cultural capital in America operated in the same way and provided an understanding of the kind of underpinnings we were talking about was kind of our next task. So we wanted to look at consumption in the 21st century, and to see if social positioning was as fixed as it was in French society. And, and to do so, we took the same relational approach to consumption that, that Bourdieu did, uh, and he treated each choice as a difference, a distinction, and, and it had its property in terms of its gap with other choices we might make. So rather than trying to position individuals, he, he tried to position different patterns of taste or different patterns of consumption. So the technique he used was correspondence analysis. And the closest kind of proxy to this would be something between factor analysis and cluster analysis. Um, so we replicated Bourdieu's analytic strategy. 
When you do this, you really uh, um, think about kind of displaying things along multiple dimensions. Bourdieu did two dimensions. We followed suit. Um, the first dimension is the overall volume of capital, right? And, and the term social capital is derived from uh, uh, fr uh, Bourdieu's notion of cultural capital and then advanced by Coleman and others. The volume of capital is, do you have a lot of capital or not very much? Whether that's cultural or economic capital may vary depending on where you are. Um, in that second dimension, which is the composition of capital. The composition of capital is whether you're emphasizing cultural capital over economic capital or economic capital over cultural capital. And you fix the space based on people's occupation, income, education, their population density, and then we mapped their consumption patterns, their media use, their social behaviors, and their patterns of civic engagement. Now, this is very small and hard to read. So everyone, everyone could come close. No, I won't make you come closer. Um, this is a second paper that we did on this topic. Um, so again, volume of consumption, that's high volume at the top. And then this is economic over cultural capital uh, 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 on this end, and then cultural over economic on the other end. And this is the bottom half of that same consumption map, where here's a very low volume. And again, you have cultural over economic and economic over cultural. So just to walk you through this, I'll go back to the top end of the map. I'm going to try to summarize what we saw as kind of patterns of consumption and civic life when we did this kind of correspondence mapping. So what we see in this upper corner, these are people who are high in, high in volume of capital and emphasizing cultural capital over uh, uh, economic capital. And these should look familiar to you because they're probably most of the people in this room. Um, these are established professionals, highly educated. They tend to use prestige news media, the New York Times. Um, high cultural and art. They tend to go to the art galleries and the openings and the public lectures. Um, they love international travel. How many of you have left the country? How many of you have a passport? Better than most of our congressmen. Uh, uh, um, <laughs> they tend to be check and letter activists. They don't tend to get their hands dirty. They tend to pull out the checkbook and write a check, rather than doing the hard work of civic life. Very concerned about the environment. They do some community work. Compare that to this next group down here. These are the service workers. These are the teachers, the social workers. A somewhat different group. Broadcast news media is their preference. They're kind of urban sophisticates. They're the people who hang out at coffee houses and, and um, uh, do that kind of work. Volunteerism and membership. These are the heavy lifters of civil society. Um, ideologically, they're moderate. They're neither conservative or liberal. They're across the board ideologically. And they like social dramas for entertainment viewing and, and informational TV content like documentaries. Compare that to this other high group. These are executives and sales folks, high income. They tend to read a mainstream paper like USA Today. Fashion and high-end retail, these are the people who shop at Pottery Barn. We may have some of those here, too. Uh, um, they stay at luxury hotels. Skiing, golf, and tennis are their preferred activities. Very little civic engagement from this group. Next group here, we've got the technicians. These are kind of high-tech uh, uh, folks, youthful, sports and drinking, hyper-technological, highly sexualized. You'll see some internet porn use in this group. Uh, um, and then they, they love SUVs. I don't know what that tells us about them, but it scared me a little bit. Uh, um, if we go further down to the bottom end, the low volume of capital, here you see an older group, more conservative, very religious, frankly, made up mainly of female homemakers, heavy church attendance, religious program viewing, kind of moralistic and justice drama. So from the time period that this was done, their favorite shows were things like Walker, Texas Ranger. <laughs> And, and touched by an angel, right? Um, and local news viewing was their primary way of getting civic information. At the very low end here, again, very low volume of capital, low income, low education, they live at home, soap operas, print tabloids, again, few civic practices. Here we have a, a kind of urban or ex-urban uh, uh, community, uh, uh, working class, police reality TV, uh, uh, African-American black sitcoms, discount shopping, low church attendance, and almost anti-civic. Not really, not only not involved in civic life, but actually negative relationships to some of those uh, uh, patterns. And then lastly, we have this again kind of younger exurb and underneath the tech folks, uh, uh, industry and service, uh, uh, rock and roll, uh, youth media, 
Uh, they're kind of gearheads. Uh, they love NASCAR, and this is where you get the most X-rated movie, movie viewing as well. So what we see here, I think, is in many respects the social space in America maps very similarly to what Bourdieu saw in 1960s France. There's a clear correspondence between various civic behaviors, people's ideology, and their positioning of taste. But what's interesting is if you look across that kind of that continuum from left to right, we see a, a, we interpret it as a distinction between the kind of communal on the one hand and the more individualistic on the other, uh, on that horizontal axis, kind of the refined versus the coarse, the nurturing versus the competitive. Um, anthropologists have referred to it in things like the raw versus the cooked, right? I mean, this notion of how sophisticated we are and how we tend to use and think about culture. Um, what's also interesting is the importance of gender and generation uh, uh, in the U.S., um, and this is revealing elements that were missing from Bourdieu. Bourdieu focused mainly on men, didn't really interview women as part of his uh, uh, research, and so this was a bit of an advancement. So we wanted to dig a little bit deeper in this question of gender and generation as we were trying to puzzle over what is the relationship between civic life uh, uh, and these consumption patterns. Um, does gender structure the preference for particular forms of cultural capital, and how does it differ across generational groups? So this is yet another paper we did uh, that we just recently published. Uh, and here we began by just mapping, taking that same correspondence map, but instead of mapping the properties of their behavior, mapping where individuals were located. Right? And so instead of the Q sort, we essentially did the R sort. Uh, um, and what you see here is men and women tend to kind of mix across this. It's not a gendered pattern per se. Uh, so the lighter dots are women, the darker dots are men, and we, we see if this is the more individualistic end of the continuum and this is the more communal, we see a kind of interesting spread here. What you do see is a generational difference. So the lighter is the civic generation, which tends to be over here, and we see more in terms of Gen X and boomers uh, uh, on this other side of the map. And I'm sorry some of that is so light that it's hard to see. Um, and if we mix gender and generation together, we see a very interesting pattern. And that is, for the oldest generation, this is civic, we see, again, the very lighter dots for women over here, and the male dots tend to uh, 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 be over here, indicating very clearly demarked roles, the individualistic being a more kind of male quality, the more communal and nurturing being the more female quality. But if we get to the boomer generation, what we've seen is the whole cloud, the whole generation has moved more into that more individualistic domain. We see a general movement in this direction where a lot of women are now colonizing the male space or that male identity. And that's, I think, an interesting reflection. What's particularly interesting about the next generation, Generation X, is that entire continuum breaks down. That nurturing mindset is not a male or female trait. It's just a trait that tends to cut across those uh, 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 previously gendered identities. So when we think about citizenship and consumption, we see this tr changing terrain by age and gender. Gender no longer structures preferences for communal versus individual, especially among the youngest generations. Refinement and nurture are less defining of femininity or masculinity uh, for Generation X. And those differences to us, again, demanded deeper attention. As you can see, I'm moving further and further away from that initial assumption about consumption bad towards consumption's complicated. What's going on here? And what is its relationship to civic life? So as we complicate consumption, uh, I think one of the first and kind of most jarring insights I arrived to was it, was it was a mistake to draw a sharp line between consumption and citizenship. That what we were seeing here was patterns where there was a lot of overlap. Um, consumer choices are oftentimes very public spirited. Um, and you can see this in the cafe culture from the 18th century where, you know, that's how people formed community was by hanging out in cafes and talking. We see this in terms of brand communities now. You see this as Harley Rider clubs who do civic works or people who are Apple enthusiasts setting up online groups to support one another and provide aid and, uh, and resources. We see this in boycotting, boycotting Walmart or, or boy, boycotting Heinz ketchup if you, if you don't like John Kerry. Uh, um, and then also boycotting and kind of conscientious consumption behaviors. And the list of these kinds of behaviors where we see the kind of consumer and the citizen converging are growing in length. And so we see everything from kind of human rights and the anti-sweatshop movement was a big thing on the UW campus. Unfair labor practices and fair trade coffee. I just had a cup of coffee from your local uh, cafe here. Every choice was fair trade. Uh, um, 
environmentalism and hybrid cards, economic equality and discount designers, patriotism and nationalistic buying or buying American, localism and boycotting chain retailers, many efforts to say, you know, shop on Main Street rather than at the big box, box store, anti-globalism and, you know, anytime there's an anti-globalism protest, the first thing they tend to destroy is the Kentucky Fried Chicken or the McDonald's franchise, right? I mean, that's what they go after. And even things like global health and the red campaign, um, these are all examples of where consumption and our sense of citizenship have started to converge. Um, and so the question became, if consumption isn't bad, is it instead a new form of participation? Are we seeing people shift their attention away from engaging in conventional political action, dealing with institutions, dealing with elected officials, and shifting their attention to consumer choices? especially younger generations where uh, uh, maybe some of those earlier distinctions have broken down. So this next phase was, again, this further and further movement away from this question of consumption bad towards really questioning consumption and saying, well, who is a socially conscious consumer and why? Uh, what role does media and talk play? As a communication scholar, we always come back to that. Uh, what about the Internet? And uh, since I'm presenting to CITS, I should probably mention the Internet at some point during this talk. Uh, um, is political consumer, consumerism increasing? Um, and, and if so, what explains change over time? So this is, again, yet another paper we did uh, uh, back in, in 2007, and then we have a follow-up to it as well. Um, in this paper, we theorized a very simple model, uh, basically an, an extension of the standard OSOR model, where we have kind of demographics and predispositions as the background, information-seeking variables as the stimulus, creating a set of outcome orientations or actions that lead to a final and ultimate behavioral response. So we had a whole host of predispositions that we wanted to control and account for, but our main factors here were really conventional news consumption and online news use, driving things like political discussion, environmental concern, I, I, I'm, advertising paternalism really didn't do anything, I'll skip that, leading ultimately to political consumerism. And what I mean by political consumerism, again, is these boycotting and boycotting behaviors where instead of going to the voting booth to exercise our political power once every two years or in a primary or general election, we could be political every day through our consumer choices, right? Let me ask you just this a real quick question. How many of you tend to favor certain brands because they align with your values? How many of you would say you're environmental? Um, how many of you ever boycotted a brand? I mean... I, it's amazing as I've gone around the country and done various versions of this talk and other talks, how much that varies. I mean, there are places where, like this audience, most everyone will raise their hands, and there's other places where maybe half or a third do. This is truly something that, again, we're seeing the emergence of this, I think, as a set of, or a possibility, part of a repertoire of various kinds of civic behaviors. One of my students who's now a professor at, at uh, USC Annenberg talks about civic vocabularies. And I think for young people, Political consumption has become part of their civic vocabulary. It's something that they do um, as a set of choices. So to test this question, we went to national uh, uh, panel survey data that we collected. Uh, we did this mainly to look at behavior during elections and more conventional forms of civic and political participation. But in this paper, we looked specifically at political consumption. So this was done, uh, uh, we had a base survey in 2002, recontacted in 2004. Um, uh, first wave of the survey had about a 55% uh, response rate, a 61% response rate for the recontact. Robust and reliable measures of political consumption, conventional internet news use, political expression and those various concerns, and then a whole host of control variables. And I'll give you the simplified version of the model rather than putting up you know, six regression tables just for, for ease of understanding. We controlled for all those background factors and looked at the relationship between conventional news use, online news use, and these factors. And what we found was conventional news use drove political talk. We've seen a lot of work suggesting starting with, you know, a, a, a two-step flow and moving forward, or even if you want to go back earlier, Gabriel Tard's work arguing for the importance of news as a resource for talk, um, that conventional news drives political talk, but it also drives environmental concerns. Online news use here was found to be the most important factor in driving uh, 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 environmental concerns. And then these both uh, influence political consumerism. This is a cross-sectional model. We ran the model again because we have panel data as a, a fixed effects model and found exactly the same thing. And I could show you that as well, but why show you two tables when I can just show you one? Um, 
So when we talk about lifestyle politics, we, we observe associations between communication and consumption orientations and these kinds of lifestyle politics choices. Um, conventional and online news uh, uh, work through expression and concerns to influence those choices in the same way that we see for other kinds of civic and political behavior. So a lot of my work is focused on what I'd call communication mediation, looking at the role that online and face-to-face -face political talk play in mediating the role of news consumption on civic participation. What we're seeing here is that same pattern seems to be in place for these forms of political consumerism. Um, and we replicated this across both a cross-sectional model and a fixed effects model to examine change over time, seeing uh, uh, very parallel results. So again, um, the question I think that occurred to us as we moved out of this research, uh, moving further and further away from that initial assumption about consumption bad was, again, we're seeing examples of where consumption is not only complicated but quite good. Uh, consumption is a way of people uh, uh, engaging uh, with their communities, with politics, expressing their political will. Um, I think the subtitle of the talk is politics at the checkout line, right? I mean, that is an interesting way of behaving politically. Um, the other argument that emerged during the time that we were doing this work was, again, Juliet Shore, uh, who's been one of the uh, kind of chief proponents of really questioning consumption and its relationship to civic life, uh, wrote a new book, and that book was titled Born to Buy. And in that book, she highlighted that very concern that began my own work on this topic, which was we're socializing young people into buying at younger and younger ages. Um, who has kids in this room? I mean, you know how much you get marketed to. Our strategy at McDonald's was to market to two- to five-year-old kids to get them to complain to their parents to take them to McDonald's. Then we had another marketing strategy towards the parents to say, take your kids to McDonald's, you deserve a break, right? It's insidious. I mean, it's frightening how, how orchestrated this is. And the truth is, we do see a culture where we're training young people to buy. Um, so my question was, are we seeing that same process in terms of socializing them into political consumption? Is that process something that media is creating as well? Um, and here, the question was really focused on the role of the internet, which is the preferred choice in terms of media for younger people but then also the role of political advertising, partly because young people don't control their exposure to political advertising. It comes to them because of them watching different kinds of TV programs. And it used to be easier for them to avoid because they didn't tend to watch a lot of news and a lot of soap operas. But in the last two election cycles, what we've seen is that political advertising used to be restricted to four or five genres because election campaigns have gone from billion dollars to $10 billion. That media content has flowed into all kinds of other broadcast spaces. We see it all over cable television now. We see it in entertainment content. We see it during prime time. Um, so to look at this question, we had to merge two data sets. The one is content-coded ad by data on the placement of campaign messages. This is work collected by uh, the Campaign Media Analysis Group and coded at the University of Wisconsin by Ken Goldstein. And this is literally tracking... In, the, in this case, it was over uh, 1,130,000 airings of presidential ads across the United States during the election. Uh, um, and then we married that with U.S. survey data of parent-child dyads collected around the 2008 election. So this is, again, another paper that just recently appeared. For that political ad placement data, this was data that, again, was tracked using essentially any time an ad would air for the first time, it would get a digital signature. Every time that same ad would air anywhere else, CMAG would tag it and say, that same air ad aired again. The first time an, air, an ad aired and it had a unique digital signature, that ad would be sent to Wisconsin and be content coded. Content coded for whether it was a presidential ad, a gubernatorial ad, a senatorial ad, whether it was positive or negative or a contrast ad, for all kinds of different features. Um, now, here's what's interesting. If you have information on where ads have appeared, and you know whether they're positive or negative, and you know what shows in which they've appeared, you can take that and marry it with geocoded survey data in some really interesting ways if you have people's patterns of television consumption. Now, if we were to ask people how much political advertising have you seen, how many people would say they see a lot of political advertising? Would everyone say they see a lot? 
you get a fraction in the state of California compared to what we get in Wisconsin. We get bombarded with it. I mean, the amount of political advertising. So the irony is, if I ask if you've seen a lot of political advertising, most people would say, oh, yeah, I see a lot of political ads. But if literally you can't watch television from basically 4 in the afternoon or 3 in the afternoon until 11 at night, and not every commercial block for six weeks is purely political ads. Right? They've bought out every bit of possible space. That's how, how, how invasive it is in a way. So to get a good estimate of how much people are exposed to, it's not great to ask them how many ads have you seen because they won't be able to give you a good estimate. So what we have to do is use an algorithm, and that algorithm takes the volume of political advertising that was in their locality in particular programs, right? So we know how much negative political advertising or positive political advertising was in morning news shows or was in sitcoms or was in dramas or was in talk shows or was in soap operas or was in the evening news shows. And then we have individual measures of how much do you tend to watch this kind of program? And we use those and combine those so we have a, a, a kind of individual propensity estimation based on your likelihood of watching programming content that contain political advertising as measured by the amount of political advertising in that genre in your geographic location, based on your designated market area, your DMA. So this accounts for the localized nature of ad placement, differences the potential for exposure based on individuals' viewing patterns, and the content of the ads themselves, since each of those ads was content coded. So to look at this then, we, developed, we did two models. One was, these are again of adolescence. We're comparing political participation and political consumerism. And what we notice, first of all, is, well, conventional news sources, TV and print, don't matter much for young people. They just don't. The internet, on the other hand, online news sources matter mightily, especially for political participation, but also uh, uh, for political uh, uh, consumerism. And we see the same pattern for political social network use. And this is use of Facebook or other sources of ways to communicate online with others who share or don't share your political viewpoints. And this was things like being a fan of a politician, but also talking about politics through social networks, et cetera. In both cases, we see that online and social, uh, political social network use have positive effects on political and political consumerism. But when we look at the effects of political advertising, the effects of political advertising, there's no effect on political participation. The effects instead are concentrated on political uh, uh, consumerism and concentrated in the very same ways we see the effects of political ads on adult samples in terms of the effects on political and civic participation. And the effect is as follows. The volume of exposure to political advertising, the amount of political advertising you see, tends to increase your political orientations and ultimately your political behaviors. In the case of adults, that means more political and civic participation. In the case of young people, it mean, means more political consumerism. In the case of the negativity of that, and this is the second measure here is a ratio, a proportion measure. If the campaign you're exposed to is mainly negative rather than positive, the more negative that campaign becomes, the more it suppresses your political orientations. We see the same thing among adults. And this is this long-running debate within political science and communication, which is, are political ads good or bad? And the answer is, well, they're both. The volume of political ads we see tend to be mobilizing. But when political ads get really negative and campaigns become overly negative, that tends to have suppressive effects. Those suppressive effects among adults tend to be focused on reducing their orientation towards news consumption. On young people, those effects appear to be concentrated on reducing their levels of political consumerism. So, coming full circle, in terms of digital natives during elections, online news and political social network use were related to political engagement, uh, uh, both participation and uh, 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 consumerism. But it was the negativity of political ad exposure that suppressed political consumerism, while the volume supported that kind of activism and participation. And so, at the end of this talk, and I think I'm officially nearly out of time. Um, again, I, I, I have to kind of go back to that starting point and re recognize how wrong I was when I first began doing this research about 
a, a decade ago. Um, that a lot of the assumptions I began with were not correct. That consumption is actually central to politics in some interesting ways. It's not something antithetical. Uh, it's actually quite an important outlet. It's part of young people in particular, their civic vocabularies. Um, we know that the social positioning of taste matters and how we consume is related to our civic and political choices. But more than that, the media content that we encounter also tends to shape the potential for us to engage in political consumerism, both among adults but also among adolescents, where we're seeing the strongest effects among younger people. And so began with some simplistic concerns, arrived at some serious reconsiderations, and leave with a whole set of new questions. And uh, I open it up now to you to ask me more questions. For those who are interested in these topics, people like Bruce and Lauren and others who are here have participated in uh, 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 these two conferences we've held. They've both uh, uh, now been issues of the Annals of the American Academy of Political and Social Science um, that are dedicated to the question of studying political consumerism. People like Lance Bennett and Juliet Shore and a whole host of different people have uh, participated in those conferences and had their work appear in these volumes. So if it's something that you're curious about, um, I think it's emerging as an area of serious scholarship and study, and I hope uh, uh, some of you choose to uh, pursue it. Thank you very much.